scientists are not eliminating God. They're eliminating models of God. You learn Sanskrit. Go back to your scriptures. Go back to your Vedas and realize that God is one. Division in Islam is prohibited. We understand the concept of God in Hinduism. Quran is the most positive book. Every day, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted in India after they identified that they're females. According to the statutes of 1996, U.S. Department of Justice, 2,730 women are being raped every day. Every 32 seconds, one woman is being raped. I've been raped in U.S. until the time I'm here. Islam has the solutions to the problems of the West. Of the West. If you can understand the concept of God in a religion, then only can you understand that religion in the right perspective. The common Hindu says, that everything is God. We Muslims say everything is God's. G-O-D with an apostrophe S. The major difference is the apostrophe S. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe S, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If any Christian can show me a single unambiguous unequivocal statement where Jesus Christ peace be upon himself says that I am God or where he says worship me I am ready to accept Christianity I am ready to put my head on the guillotine <laughs> let's try and understand the concept of God in Islam the best reply that any Muslim can give you regarding the concept of God in Islam is quote to you Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul huwa Allah hu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allah hu samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kuffan ad. There is nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is given in the glorious Quran. Any person says, so and so candidate is God, if that candidate fits in this four-line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting him as Almighty God. The first is, Qul huwa Allahu ad. Say he's Allah one and only. Second is, Allahu samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Third is, Lam yulid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. And the fourth is, Walam yakul lahu kuffan ad. There's nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, given in the glorious Quran. Any person claiming that so-and-so candidate is God, if that candidate fits in this four-line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. This Surah class is the touchstone of theology. It is the litmus test to identify whether the candidate claiming to be God is really a true God or not. For example, there are many people who consider Bhagwan Rajneesh to be God. In question answer time, there was a Hindu who told me, the brother Zakir, we don't consider Bhagwan Rajneesh to be God. The Hindus don't consider him to be God. I said, never did I say that Hindus believe him to be God. I've read the Hindu scriptures. Nowhere do the Hindu scriptures say that Bhagwan Rajneesh is God. I said, many people consider Bhagwan Rajneesh to be God. Let's put this Bhagwan Rajneesh to the test of Surah class. The first is, Kul huwa Allah ahad. Say, he is Allah one and only. Was Bhagwan Rajneesh one and only? Was he the only man who has claimed divinity? There are thousands of men who have claimed divinity. And especially the country where I come from, India, there are tens of thousands of men who have claimed to be God. He's not the only one. But Rajneesh Bhakt will say, no, he is unique. So let's go to the next test. Allah hu samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Was Rajnish absolute and eternal? When we read his autobiography, we come to know 
that Rajnish, he was suffering from diabetes mellitus, from asthma, from chronic backache. Imagine Almighty God suffering from diabetes mellitus, from asthma, from chronic backache. <laughs> Third test, Lam Vilad Valam Vilad. He begets not, nor is begotten. We know Bhagavan Rajnish, he was born in the state of Madhya Pradesh. He had a mother and father. In 1981, he goes to America. And in the state of Oregon, he starts his village called as Rajnishpuram. And he takes thousands of Americans for a ride. Later on, the American government, they arrest him. And Rajnish, he alleges that the American government gave me slow poisoning. Imagine Almighty God being slow poisoned. And in 1985, the American government kicks him out of the country and he comes back to India. And in the city of Pune, he goes back to his center, which is today called as Osho Commune. And if you go to his center in Pune, there is a Samadhi. And on the Samadhi, there is a stone which mentions there, Bhagwan Rajnish, Osho, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. Never born, never died. But visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. They forgot to mention on his samadhi that he was not given visas to 21 different countries of the world. <laughs> Imagine Almighty God coming on this earth to visit the earth and requires visa to grow different countries. And the Archbishop of Greece said, if you don't remove Rajnish out of this country, we'll burn his house and the house of his disciples. And the last test, Walam there's nothing like him. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. And we know Rajnish, like the common human beings. He had two eyes, one nose, one mouth, white beard, two hands. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. For example, someone says that Almighty God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You may have heard the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, who got the title Mr. Universe, Mr. World, the strongest man in the universe, the strongest man in the world. The moment you can compare God to anyone, whether it be Anus Foschniger, Dara Singh, or King Kong, whether it be a thousand times or million times, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. There's nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, given in the glorious Quran. Any candidate says that he is worshipping so-and-so God, if that candidate fits in this four-line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. And this is exactly what is mentioned in the other religious scriptures, as is mentioned in the Quran, that we have to believe in one God. He has got no idols. He has got no images. You have to worship him alone. He has got no parents. He is neither born, neither does he beget. He is absolute and eternal. This is common in all the religious scriptures. Time does not permit me to speak of other religions. If you see my lecture, concept of God in major world religions, besides Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and Hinduism, what I spoke today, there are similar messages given in the other religious scriptures of Parthism, that is Zoroastrianism, Sikhism, somewhat similar. So when this message is common, let us agree today that all the human beings, we will only worship one God who has got no images who has got no statue. And we worship him alone and no one else, who has got no parents. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Let's try and understand, as the Quran says, the most important thing when speaking about commonalities is about Almighty God. While doing Dawa, you can speak of anything, no problem to start with, but unless you do not come to the topic of Tawheed, your Dawah is useless. Any other thing you speak about, you can start with to come to the main point. But until you do not convince the concept of Almighty God, your Dawah is useless.
So interfaith dialogue, it's very important that the concept of Almighty God is clarified. Not saying that all gods are the same. Ram is also the same, Jesus is the same, Allah is the same. This is not at all what is mentioned in the scriptures. We have to believe in one true God. Let's discuss the second most important common point that we discuss regarding the messengers. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 24, wa in illa nazir. There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warner or a guide. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ra, chapter number 13, verse number 7, wa li in had. And to every people have we sent a warner. By name, there are 25 messengers mentioned in the Quran. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. By name, 25 messengers have been mentioned in the Quran. But a beloved Prophet Muhammad also said, is mentioned in Sahih Hadith, which is mentioned in Mishkat al Masabi, volume number three, Hadith number 5737, where a beloved Prophet said, there were 124,000 prophets sent on the face of the earth. And the same hadith is also repeated in Ahmad ibn Hanbal, volume number 5, page number 265 and 266. That the Prophet said, there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. But by name, only 25 are mentioned in the Quran. But all the messengers that came before, the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were only sent for their people. And the message which they brought was supposed to be followed till a particular time period. But because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger, as is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 40. Ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadim mirjalikum, wa laakhi Rasulullah, wa khatamin nabeen, wa kana Allah bi kulli shayin alima. Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the father of any of you men, but he is the messenger of Allah. And he is the seal of the prophets. Allah is all knowing, full of wisdom. Because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger of Almighty God, he was not sent only for the Muslims or only for the Arabs. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, Wama arsalnaka illa rahmatillah alameen, that we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to the whole of humanity. The Quran says in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28, arsalna ka illa ka nas, bashiro wa naziro, that we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings and warning them against sin. But most of the human beings yet do not know. Because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger, he was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs, he was sent for the whole of humanity. And because he was the last and final messenger, he is not only mentioned in the Quran, but he is mentioned in all the major religious scriptures of the world. He is mentioned in the scriptures of all the major world religions. <laughs> of Nuh, peace be upon him, the floods swept the entire earth, sparing only those who believed. Today, floods of shirk, floods of innovation, and floods of desires and lust are sweeping the whole earth. Al-Imam Malik ibn Anas of Medina said that the Sunnah is the Ark of Nuh. Whoever boards it is saved and whoever refuses is drowned and is doomed forever. Join me in Al-Arba'een Al-Nawawiyyah, the 40 hadith compiled by Al-Imam al nawawi Join Asim Al-Hakim in Al-Arba'een Al-Nawawiyyah tonight.
at 8.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 8.30 a.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Discussion, 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 debate, 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 debate. Rebuttal, 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 conclusion, conclusion. Eliminate misconceptions about religion. Get enlightened. Witness Dr. Zakir Naik in a battle of words in Crossfire every Friday at 8.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 10 a.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. Invite, Invite all night to the way of the thy way Lord, Lord thy with Lord, wisdom with and wisdom beautiful and preaching, preaching and argue and with, argue them, with them, them in ways, in that, ways are that are best and most and gracious. Most gracious. Allah has not asked us to make people Muslim. Invite, offer, share. Allah has asked us to invite people to Islam. Be a part of the special mission for humankind. Dawah is really an art. We need to refocus on the importance of Dawah. And this is about time the Ummah woke up. In this unique workshop with Abdur Rahim Green, we can't force anyone to be Muslim. What if we, as an Ummah, could once again take up the duty and obligation of Dawah? Learn how to aptly deliver Allah's message of Islam to people around the world in Dawah. Tonight at 10.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 6.30 a.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. When we read the Hindu scriptures, there are several prophecies of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, given in Hindu scriptures. It's mentioned in the Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhya 3, Shlokas 5 to 8. Time will not permit me to go through all the prophecies. I'll just give the reference and give the synopsis of the prophecies. It's mentioned in these shlokas that a man would come who will be a Malaycha, that means a foreigner. He'll come from Marusthal, which is a sandy track, that is a desert. He'll come along with the companions, that is the Sahabas, and his name will be Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's further mentioned in Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhya 3, Shlokas 10 to 27. There will be a man who will come to fight against his enemy. His name will be Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And his followers will be a man who's circumcised, who will not have a tail on his head, will not have a choti or a shendi. He will grow a beard. He will give the call for prayer, that is the azan. He will create a revolution. He will eat all lawful things, but will not have the flesh of swine. He will not be purified by herbs and shrubs, will be purified by warfare. His followers will be called Musalman. This is a prophecy talking about Muhammad Sallallahu He further prophesied even in Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3. Khand 1, Adhay 3, Shlokas 21 and 23, talking about how evil has spread in the seven cities of India, and a man will come by the name of Muhammad to purify the cities of India. He further prophesied in the Kuntap Suktas, the Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 127, verse number 1 to 14. It says, a person will come by the name of Kaurama. Kaurama, one of its meanings means the Prince of Peace, and the other meaning is an immigrant, and Prophet Muhammad was both, he was a prince of peace, as well as an immigrant. He migrated from Makkah to Medina. He will have 60,090 enemies, which is approximately the number of people that were against the Prophet in Makkah. It further says that he will ride a camel. And it says he'll be called as Vishwis Reb. Vishwis Reb means one who praises. If you translate into Arabic, it means Ahmad. He further prophesied in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 6, talking about the battle of Azab, that a man will come by the name of Karu, meaning one who praises. In Arabic, it's Ahmad, which is the other name of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And he will fight against the enemy, which will be 10,000 in number, and he will win the battle without the battle being fought. This is exactly what is mentioned in the seerah of the Prophet, and even given in the Quran in Surah Azab. 
Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam further prophesied in Athar Waved, book number twenty, hymn number twenty-one, verse number seven, that he will overpower twenty kings and sixty thousand and ninety-nine enemies. We know that there were about twenty tribes at the time of the Prophet who were against the Prophet, and the enemies were about sixty thousand in number. And this man will be called as Abandu. Abandu means one who is helpless and orphan. It also means one who is praiseworthy. If you translate into Arabic, it means Muhammad, which is the name of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The same prophecy is also repeated in Rig Veda, book number one, hymn number fifty-three, verse number nine. Only the name is changed from Abandu to Sushrama, which also means one who is praiseworthy. If you translate into Arabic, it means Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is also prophesied in Psalm Veda, Agni, mantra number sixty-four, saying. That this prophet, he will not go to his mother for milk, and he will not be breastfed by the mother. And you know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was not breastfed by his own mother, but by Dai Halima. There are several prophecies. Time will not permit me to go into details. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is prophesied as Ahmad. That means one who praises, which is another name of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in several places. In Psalm Ved, Uttar Chik, Mantra number one thousand five hundred. In Psalm Ved, Indra, chapter number two, Mantra one fifty two. In Yajur Ved, chapter number thirty one, verse number eighteen. In Rig Ved, book number eight, hymn number six, verse number ten. In Atharva Ved, book number eight, hymn number five, verse number sixteen. In Atharva Ved, book number twenty, hymn number one twenty six, Mantra number fourteen. In several places, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been prophesied as Ahmad. Furthermore, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has also been prophesied as Narashansa. Nar in Sanskrit means a man. Shansa coming from the word prashansa, meaning praiseworthy. So Narashansa means one who is praiseworthy. So Narashansa means a man who is praiseworthy, which is the literal translation of the Arabic word Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mentioned by name as Narashansa. In several places in Hindu scriptures, in Rig Veda, book number one, chapter number thirteen, verse number three; in Rig Veda, book number one, chapter number eighteen, verse number nine; in Rig Veda, book number one, chapter number one hundred and six, verse number four; in Rig Veda, book number one, chapter one forty two, verse number three; in Rig Veda, book number two, hymn number three, verse number two; in Rig Veda, book number five, hymn number five, verse number two; Rig Veda, book number seven, hymn number two, verse number two; in Rig Veda, book number ten. Hymn number sixty-four, verse number three. Rig Veda, book number ten. Hymn number one eighty-two, verse number two. It's also mentioned in Yajur Veda, chapter number twenty, verse thirty-seven. Yajur Veda, chapter number twenty, verse number fifty-seven. Yajur Veda, chapter twenty-one, verse number thirty-one. Yajur Veda, chapter twenty-one, verse fifty-five. Yajur Veda, chapter number twenty-eight, verse number two. Yajur Veda, chapter number twenty-eight, verse number nineteen. Yajur Veda, chapter number twenty-eight, verse number forty-two. Yajur Veda, chapter twenty-nine, verse number twenty-seven. I can't keep on quoting and giving references only of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned in the scriptures. Time will not permit us. For more details, surely you can refer to my video cassette, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Hindu Scriptures. I would just like to briefly mention about one more prophecy which is very important in the Hindu Scriptures about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is about Kalki Avatar. He is prophesied in Bhagavad Purana, Khand 12, Adhyay 2, Mantra number 18 to 20. It says that in the house of Vishnu Yas, the noble-souled Brahmin. Who is the chief of the village of Sambhala will be born the avatar by the name of Kalki, and he will have eight spiritual powers. He will be lord of the universe. He will be given a white horse, and he will fight against the devil. A similar prophecy repeated in Bhagavad Purana, book number one, hymn number three, mantra number twenty-five, with the addition that he will be born in the womb of Sumati. He saw the prophet as in Kalki Purana, chapter number two, verse number four, five, seven, eleven, fifteen. Point number one: He'll be born in the house of Vishnu Yas. That means his father's name will be Vishnu Yas. Vishnu means God. Yas means servant, servant of God. And the name of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's father was Abdullah, which we translate into English, it means servant of God. Point number two is: His mother's name will be Sumati. Sumati means peaceful. It means serenity. If you translate into Arabic, it means Amina, which is the name of the mother of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Third point is 
that he will be born in the village by the name of Sambhala. Sambhala means a home of peace, a place of peace, which is nothing but Makkah, where the beloved prophet was born. The fourth point is he'll be born in the chief of the village of Sambala, and we know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in the family of Quraysh, which was the chief of Makkah. It further says point number five that he will be an Antim Brishi. He'll be the last and final messenger, which is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse number 40, that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the last and final messenger. Point number six, he will be born on the 12th month of Madhav. And we know some of the records say that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born on 12th Rabbi Awal. It further says, point number seven, that he will get the first revelation on the mountains. And then he'll migrate northwards and come back. We know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first revelation he got was in jabal nur the mountain of light in gar hira And later on, he migrated northwards towards Medina and came back. Point number eight says that he will have graceful qualities. Point number nine says he'll be given eight spiritual qualities, which are wisdom, self-control, revealed knowledge, respected lineage, valor, that is strength, measured speech, utmost charity, and gratefulness. All these eight qualities befit no one but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Point number 10 says, he will be a teacher to the full world. He'll be a universal messenger, which is mentioned in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28. It further says, he will be given a white horse by the devtas, by the angels. He will ride a horse with the sword in the right hand. Point number 13, that he will fight against the enemies and will kill the wicked people. Point number 14 says that he will be helped by four companions, talking about the first four Khulfa Rashidin, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with them all. And the 15th point is that he will be helped by the angels in the battlefield, which we know that in the battle of Badr, it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 123 and 125, as well as Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 8 to 9, it says that Prophet Muhammad was helped by the angels. So all these prophecies are pointing towards the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hindu scriptures. So if a person is a Hindu, if he follows the Hindu scriptures, for him to be a practicing Hindu, besides believing in one God, and believing that God has got no images, he has got no idols, and worship that God Almighty, he should also believe that the last and final messenger, the last and final avatar, the Kalki avatar, is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For more details, refer to my video cassette, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hindu scriptures. Locals may or may not fortify your money. Investments may or may not increase your wealth. But giving zakat certainly fortifies, increases, as well as purifies your wealth. Support Peace TV. Send your zakat and donation to IRFI, Al Ryan Bank, Quadrant Court, 48 Calthorpe Road, Birmingham, UK. Pound account number 01132301. IBAN GB52 LOYD 3096 3401024192. Sort code 300083. Swift BIC code IBOBG B22. Please confirm your bank transfers at admin at peacetv.tv. Support Peace Team.